Hi, everyone. My name is Stefan Norgard. I'm a third year PhD student at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. And I'm very happy to be here, although it's virtual, at the 11th International Conference on Food Studies. Uh, thanks to Common Ground Research Networks and the many other colleagues who have engaged with this material. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now and um, make this full screen. All right. Uh, so my presentation is titled Planning, Violence, and Crisis in Socio-Historical Perspective. And this is a mixed methods inquiry into avocado commodity chains and productions and resultant networks of cartelization in the municipality of Tancitero, which is in uh, the Southern Mexican state of Michoacan. When you enter the city of Tancitero, you uh, see this monument to the avocado and uh, the pit of the avocado that has uh, the world. And indeed, uh, per capita and at the municipal level, Tancitero produces the highest uh, concentration of avocados globally. And uh, for a municipality, this is uh, certainly quite a feat. However, uh, there's something else happening in Michoacan and in Tancitero in particular. Residents there live in an ongoing state of crisis and violence. Uh, violence is indeed so regular that many residents have become detached from it uh, or have to fight constant violence and networks of violence uh, with their own practices of violence. And so in this presentation, I'm going to engage that crisis of violence and think about it in a different way than we might using conventional methodologies or conventional wisdom. Specifically, I'm hoping to foreground a critical planning lens that looks at terms uh, like Lefebvre's production of space um, and also thinks critically about planning theory and planning practice uh, to interrogate the relationships between avocado production and agro industry and resultant dynamics of violence uh, using Tancitero as a situated, grounded and historic uh, case study. So let's start by interrogating the conventional wisdom. Uh, and that conventional wisdom is uh, that violence has been high and has most recently been extraordinarily high in the Southern Mexican state of Michoacan. Here, uh, these are uh, some data that I've compiled uh, drawing on Inegi and Pablo Picato et al's uh, data set on total crimes per state uh, in Mexico. And these are per 100,000 people. And as we can see here, the state of Michoacan has often lagged behind in terms of crimes uh, or, or been below uh, the national average. But a lot of that changed in the era of liberalization uh, in the 1990s. Uh, and you can see Right, right here, a pronounced spike in violence in the Mexican state of Michoacan that abetted around uh, the late 2000s, uh, but then has increased again since. Uh, the concept of uh, federal crimes against public health uh, as entered in the Ministry of Justice um, data uh, represents uh, drug trafficking crimes. And so what we can see here is um, there are certainly a, a good number of these in Michoacan and also in the Mexican state, uh, in, in, the, in the Mexican nation nationally, um, that kind of start and increase uh, in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, but this is not necessarily explaining all on its own uh, the rise in total crimes. Um, and uh, what we're seeing here, this is uh, the next kind of timeline. So we had the pre-2008, this is the post-2008 to the present set of data. And what we're seeing in the Mexican state of Michoacan is a high and rising homicide rate, particularly in the last three years or so. And um, these uh, homicide rates um, kind of culminate uh, in uh, the state of Michoacan being one of the most violent Mexican states of all in the current moment. And so conventional wisdom frames these abetting and, 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 and now soaring rates of violence to the dissolution and then reintegration or reconstitution of uh, DTOs or C uh, TCOs, drug trafficking organizations or transnational criminal organizations. And uh, here on the screen, I list um, just some of the many DTO and TCOs that operate actively in this part of Michoacan. And so the argument goes uh, that many of these drug cartels um, operate uh, with violence and a degree of impunity 
and um, operate with, alongside, and at times in contestation with Mexico's federal uh, police, local police, uh, state police, and military. And so you have numerous different um, armed state-like groups, including uh, the DTO and TCO organizations that, um, that change and morph in their size and territorial scope. And that this explains the high rates of violence in Michoacan. However, the critical planning frame takes a step back and tries to think about first violence in more historically situated and structural ways. And so specifically, this is a food studies conference, and, and this paper seeks to look at things like the dynamics of agroecology, the terrain, the terroir, the soil features inherent to a place like Tancitero, and also hopes to look at the specific and situated dynamics of both social mobilization and organization in the specific place, uh, the nature of executive power, and histories, for example, of land ownership and land regime. And I'm drawing on uh, Lefebvre, Brenner, and Eldon, as well as others, uh, to think about the production of space as this contested process of making space at once valuable, but also um, a, a space for social reproduction. Uh, in other words, um, the ways in which territory and land are indeed arenas of political contestation and are produced, reproduced, and contested by various social groups. Uh, with regard to critical planning, I'm thinking about urban planning and territorial demarcation, uh, everything from the top-down master plan to plans around avocado production and uh, planning for agro-industry and uh, planning around violence, and uh, aim to think about those plans in a critical way, one that is geared toward uh, practice, but also attends to dynamics and land regimes, properties, and spatial production. So for example, looking at rancherias, looking at the ejido system, and thinking about the Mexican revolution in its full historical extent, as all of these um, land regimes and processes relate to current uh, avocado production networks in Tancitero. And another aspect of critical planning is trying to both deterritorialize and re-territorialize our understandings of political economy in a critical way. For example, we need to think about uh, avocado production networks as they relate to networks of consumption and consumer taste here in the United States, while also thinking about how avocado production networks create social differentiation and class hierarchies within the municipality of Tancitero. Not everyone is benefiting in the same way. And so my argument overall is that uh, violence in Tancitero is a means by both powerful groups and less powerful groups toward controlling territory and its accumulated surplus. It's also a technology to contest that spatial hegemony. In other words, uh, violence is a means toward producing and reproducing space in a very Lefebvrean sense. So drawing on this critical planning framework, let's think about violence and avocado production and specifically looking at it in Tancitero. First of all, we might notice here with this uh, map that's uh, an SSP and Calderon et al. Uh, produced map from the Justice in Mexico 2020 report, we'll see the Mexican state of Michoacan here on the Pacific coast. And uh, what one can see immediately is that violence is not uh, evenly spread across the different municipalities of Michoacan, and neither is the production of avocados. So here we see the mean production of avocados by hectare. And indeed, you see a couple of clusters or belts that are quite terroir specific. Um, and um, the concept of uh, tierra caliente is, is useful here. We have a, a certain set of necessary uh, soil and agroecological features, uh, climate, the high and low temperatures, for example, that lend themselves to avocado production and specifically for the kind of Haas avocados that American consumers love. And um, these are concentrated in areas of middle elevation that are below the high volcanoes, but have experienced eruptions in the past such that the soil is fertile. And Tancitero is indeed one of these places. Tancitero is, uh, is right here. And so you can see that avocado production is not a monolithic thing. And indeed, um, there is a pretty compact spatial footprint to avocado production such that uh, hectares alone isn't really the best indicator of profit. A lot of avocados and a lot of profit can exist in a very small spatial footprint. And, and therefore, uh, this helpful uh, image from Erickson and Owen 
can help us uh, see just how much avocado production exists in uh, Tancitaro and a few other municipalities, uh, Urapan as well. And uh, these are located again in very specific belts or clusters in Michoacan. And um, once again, we see that the vast majority of avocado production, um, both in Michoacan and globally, uh, exists in a very limited number of places. At the same time, we can take a look uh, from the same Justice in Mexico report at reported homicide cases per 100,000. And what we see here, once again, looking at the Southern Mexican state of Michoacan, uh, but also looking across the Mexican uh, state at a kind of national level, what we see is that violence in Mexico does not exist monolithically throughout the territory, right? There are specific microzones or clusters that have more than 100 homicides that can actually exist right next to or abutting uh, municipalities or zones that have very few homicides. And so once again, these, these dynamics are not spatially, spatially uniform uh, or even. Where does Tancitro fit in specifically? Well, here um, we have uh, some, some data uh, first on uh, pro campo subsidies. So uh, pro campo from uh, the 1990s were a set of uh, subsidies given to farmers in different agricultural arrangements based on the hectares of uh, land. And um, interestingly, Tancitro does not have a lot of these uh, subsidies compared to other municipalities that are smaller in geographic area. And uh, there are a couple of reasons for this. One is that compared with uh, corn or maize or, or other agricultural products, a lot of avocados didn't actually uh, have agricultural arrangements in the 1990s uh, uh, when the pro campo subsidies were envisioned and the regime was crafted. Uh, the demand for this uh, particular commodity has soared only in recent uh, years. And also, as I mentioned earlier, a relatively compact or small spatial footprint can yield a lot of, of profits with avocados. And so you don't have as much um, a land in terms of hectares uh, for uh, production uh, in, in avocados. Suffice it to say, here we have not as many pro campo subsidies as other places. And, and this relates to networks of violence because uh, state subsidies to agriculture is certainly both um, an important injection of capital into specific municipalities um, and also helps explain uh, changing fortunes and changing land regimes in the late liberal context of post 1980s Mexico. At the same time, uh, we see uh, a diagram here at the level of the municipality of um, police interventions. And here, Tancitro is exceptional. It's the highest or one of the highest uh, municipal level uh, numbers of police interventions according to this Inegi data. Uh, in the state of Michoacan. And so what we're seeing here is uh, a number of, um, uh, of police parties. Again, we have the local, state, and federal level police that interface in various formal and informal ways that are paying attention to Tancitro in this 2020 data. And, and this, uh, you know, once again, speaks to how violence can be clustered at municipal and local levels. Another um, component of, of this critical planning analysis, as I mentioned, takes a look at agroecological factors. And so for example, Perez um, Montesinos' analysis looks at the meseta perpetua, um, pure pecha, pardon me, uh, with the uh, soil and climate features and uh, that volcanic history, and then the land regimes as well. Uh, and so uh, Maldonado uh, Aranda, looks at um, both a kind of history of uh, partial developmentalism in Michoacan that's kind of long had counterconducts and resistances and looks at this uh, through kind of a long durée history that takes into account the Mexican revolution and different land regimes across time. So even though haciendas and ejidos were common land regimes across Mexico broadly, this particular set of land regimes didn't really exist in the Tancitero context. And instead you had small rancherias with a few thousand residents and then indigenous communities operating here. And this matters because up until the 1990s, a lot of the current areas of avocado production were actually highland forests. In other words, um, thinking about the kind of long historical cartel dynamics that existed 
uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, the history of caciques and pistoleros in Mexico that uh, might well explain violence in other places doesn't seem to be key to the situated historical journey of Tancitero, uh, given the rapid fluctuations in violence and the changes in land regimes here. And of course, another factor is this USDA rule change in the United States that basically required specific export regimes for avocados and limited where production could take place. This really helped Tancitero in terms of their ability to produce avocados, but also clustered profit and power in the municipality and is associated with violence as well. Um, I also conducted a primary newspaper analysis looking at different articles relating to violence in Tancitero to help understand what might cause specific dynamics of violence and also what kinds of violence were present over time. It's pretty quiet before 2010, uh, but from about 2009 to 2015, the newspaper analysis reveals a, a lot of uh, sustained reporting on Tancitero. Here are two uh, very uh, relevant articles from El Universal. The first one looks at the entire cabinet of Tancitero resigning due to fear of violence. And um, then the, uh, the mayor uh, ultimately uh, resigning and uh, Cervantes, uh, Gustavo Sanchez Cervantes, uh, taking on that position as a primary school and karate teacher uh, far away from political loyalties and coalitions. Unfortunately, uh, Cervantes, this independent anti-corruption mayor, uh, was at risk and, and uh, newspaper articles from 2010 go on to show that the very next day after um, Cervantes um, took office, um, he and his secretary were both found stoned to death. And so here we see a specific type of violence, political violence and intimidation, that comes on the scene only as a unique um, coalition, a kind of uh, cartel, state, and market negotiated and mediated yet corrupt uh, coalition was uh, transposed. And when an independent anti-corruption mayor Cervantes took office. And uh, so once again, we're seeing here that violence in uh, Tancitero uh, exists as, um, as a kind of, uh, in a kind of relationship to uh, profit from avocado commodities. And indeed, avocado commodities have been called green gold, um, and, and there's a reason for that. So in the story of Tancitero, after a lot of this political violence and contestation, in the period of 2009 to 2015, we have a set of resident counterconducts, efforts to uh, counter violence, perhaps with the threat of violence once again. So. Um, the CUSEPT or uh, public security force in Tancitero was launched with filtros or checkpoints and armed guards in and around uh, the municipality. Uh, though um, from an ethnographic lens and from the bottom up, um, local residents complained that uh, in Tancitero, these self-defense groups were really funded by the growers and um, enacted and practiced with an expectation that they're protecting growers and avocado profits uh, for example, from corruption, from cartels, and from violence. Um, but there's a very limited interest in and, and protection of the workers in the avocado plants, the, the laborers. Um, and Ana, a local resident, speaks to Noria Research and Alvaro Rodriguez, uh, saying there have always been deaths here, referring to a kind of long durée, constant degree of violence toward working class um, residents in San Cicero. And indeed, recent Noria research conclusions have found that um, poverty and extreme poverty has long been high and present in Tancitero and continues and has even grown. And so the wealth and power associated with being the largest producer of avocado production globally in Tancitero may well attract violence, but it's certainly not distributing wealth to all residents. And I think um, this is where my intervention uh, comes in. So having studied um, the case of Tancitero using these mixed methods from the newspaper accounts to the quantitative data, I propose a set of complicated pathways uh, that are both politico-judicial uh, or juridical in nature and social. And they have to do with a unique mediation between political economy at the super local or, or national, multinational level. For example, thinking about um, 
cartels and relationships to import export regimes set by the United States Department of Agriculture in the United States, right? Uh, and how these interface with the unique agroecological assets of a specific place. In this case, the terroir and the soil features of a place like Tancitero. And how these dynamics of commodity capitalism and profit can indeed attract drug trafficking and transnational corporations that seek to cash in on the action, uh, but also attract members of the state that both want to regulate and interface with those DTOs and CTOs, right? to regulate or enforce or mediate violence, but also themselves want to cash in on the action. Amidst all of that, Tancitero, as well as the Mexican state, have their own local executive organizations that both mediate and moderate the drug trafficking and transnational corporation and cartel and criminal organizations. So here you have another mediation of power that can indeed turn violent and resident social mobilization and organization. And so the creation of the self-defense groups in Tancitero, as one example, was another opportunity to check or counter the DTO and TCO frame, but also led to violence, right? Countering violence with another form of violence. At each stage here, there's the possibility for violence. And indeed with each of these mediations and moderations, depending on how the profit structure works, depending on how scarcity um, exists, we have the potential for violence. And so my argument is that a unique combination or amalgamation of all of these factors collectively explains why there is high rates of violence in Tancitero. But if we think about critical planning and foreground that structural analysis, while it's tempting to think about, for example, these downstream actors as the kind of cause of violence, my, my argument would be that we need to look further upstream back here at the agroecological assets and why there's a concentrated amount of avocado production that's only possible in Tancitero in the first place. And most importantly here, the political and economic factors that create that scarcity in agroecology. For example, the USDA's import export regime and other regulations and subsidies to specific agricultural producers that concentrate avocado production in specific areas. That interfacing with land regimes and um, the ways commodity capitalism are, are structured in the Mexican state are very important root causes to understanding violence in Tancitero today. I complement this analysis with an urban theoretical foray into critical planning theory on crisis and violence. I draw on scholarship by Arendt, uh, Davis, Lefebvre, Roy, and Segato and ultimately find through this analysis that um, theories on violence and crisis uh, need to foreground uh, local situated experiences of residents themselves. And that's where I'll end this presentation. Uh, for future research, this mixed methods inquiry only solidifies the need for situated ethnographic fieldwork. In other words, talking to residents about their routine or everyday urban experiences of violence and crisis will be essential. And also thinking about violence as crisis across geographic scales and disciplinary boundaries is another important um, avenue for future research. For example, thinking across the global commodity chain of avocado production can allow scholars and practitioners to understand, um, among other things, uh, where violence exists internationally and multinationally with avocados, as well as where profit exists and for whom, and through the kind of reflexive practice dimensions of ethnography, allow scholars to think about subjective experiences of violence. And they land differently, as I expect, across people uh, of different race, class, and gender identities. In other words, there is no one monolithic experience of violence in Tancitero, and we shouldn't um, uh, create a phenomenology of violence that's monolithic uh, either. Thank you so much uh, for listening to my presentation. I look forward to engaging others' presentations and uh, best wishes for the 11th International Conference on Food Studies.